Stanford University. Uh, it's really, really great to be here. I, I feel like I'm, I'm coming home. I, I see many uh, familiar faces and people that I've had a chance to, to work with. I've got school chums here that, that, that have been here. I've got my professors here that, that uh, hopefully will uh, judge at the end of this whether they made a mistake or not and let me through. So uh, I'm really, really pleased to be here. This is really an exciting time for renewable energy. Uh, I, get, I have one of the best jobs in the entire country. I keep telling people that. And uh, it, it really is because I think there is becoming a, a, a national uh, groundswell, if you will, of, of interest and attention to something that we've been talking about really for more than 30 years. I've been at this more than 30 years now. And, uh, and, and it's kind of our time. And so despite the fact that we hear all this gloomy news, uh, you know, with the financial crisis and many of the other problems and, and uh, issues that are facing the nation, um, you know, I, I kind of feel like we're in this little uh, oasis of calm around this other, otherwise cha chaotic situation. What I'm going to do today is, is I've got uh, essentially a fairly lengthy presentation. I'm going to try to kind of fast forward through it and leave some time at the end for some questions. Uh, I want to give you a picture of where we are and, and why this is important and, and more importantly, how, what's the potential? Where can we go and how can we get there? Uh, because it hasn't always been obvious that, that this is something that... Um, the uh, you know the nation really cared about, or for that matter, thought it was what thought it was real, um, and I'll and I'll kind of throw in some anecdotes as we go along the way. Um, I've given presentations like this all around the world. Uh, I was just last week in Denmark in Copenhagen giving a seminar like this at the at the DTU, the Denmark Technical University. I've given this presentation in Tsinghua University in China, and a number of places around around the country. So uh, it's, it's very fitting, I think, that, uh, that, that Stanford get a chance to, to, to really uh, engage with us on this. Uh, again, uh, lots of interesting things. Hopefully, it'll spur some conversation at the end. Uh, I always start the conversation by saying, look, there's a series of problems. There are, for 30 years, we've been, we've been talking about them. It's really you know, not just about energy security. It's not just about economic productivity. It's not just about environmental impact. In fact, you have to solve all these problems simultaneously. Because if you don't do that, you suboptimize. So I'll, I won't belabor that. Go on to say another thing, which I like to start the, my, my, my um, presentations with, is if you look at what the economists of the world say, and these are very, very knowledgeable folks. Uh, Jim, uh, I think I saw you earlier, uh, no, no offense to economists. But the fact of the matter is, what you do when you do an analysis, you say, what will the energy system look like two decades from now? This is what you get. This is domestic, domestic U.S. energy consumption. And this is the 2009 data. So this is like current stuff. And it says that, OK, so in the next 25 plus years, we're going to go from a total of 6% renewable energy in the country to 9%. And if you take that, extend that out to 2050, you know, it may be like 10% or something. Last year, or year before last, this went from 6 to 7, OK, just to give you an idea. If you then look at what the IEA says, the, the um, International Energy Agency did the same exact analysis. Here's what they say. 13% to 14%. You know, whoopee. And where at this point, you know, the members of Congress that I talk to frequently, kind of their eyes glaze over and they say, why bother? If this is all you're going to do, why bother? And what I'm here to tell you and what I told them is that we can do a lot better. And the first, I get two questions every time I testify in front of Congress. I testified there literally two weeks ago in front of the Energy and Natural, uh, Energy and Natural Resources. This is Jeff Bingaman's committee. And I got the same question that I got like five times last year. And that was, when is this stuff going to be real, meaning renewable energy? And second, how much can we actually get? Okay? And I'm going to answer both of those questions. Um, Sally mentioned I'm on the National Science Board. Uh, from the National Science Board, I get to, uh, an opportunity to actually provide input and recommendations on policy to the President and the Congress. I'm co-chairing a task force on sustainable energy. We have essentially a report that's going to come out. It'll be out next week. You get a chance to do kind of a public comment on it. We're coming up with six findings and six recommendations. Not surprising, but here they are. First is that we need a coordinated national strategy around energy, and we have it, we call it RD3E. That's that's uh, research and development, deploy, uh, demonstration, deployment, and education. All right as well as you know, with a coordinated national strategy, we need to boost our R&D investment. We are literally uh, an order of magnitude less than what we ought to have on clean energy type technology. We need a policy and market framework that allows us to achieve the outcomes that we're looking for. 
We need to develop educational workforce development. We need to lead globally. And probably one of the most underappreciated things is this piece here, and Jim Sweeney and I had an opportunity to talk about this, is to promote public awareness and action. It has to do with behaviors. It has to do with us. Just had a meeting with your president, uh, uh, John Hennessy, and he mentioned we've met the enemy, the kind of the enemy is us. We're, we're at the point where it's, it is our behavior that's driving so many of the things that are, that are occurring here. All right, so all of these things are an important aspect of what we need to do to solve the problem. All right, I look at this thing, and when again I get asked that question, when is this stuff going to be real? The first thing I say is it's real today. It's a $150 billion business today. Most of it is not in the U.S. About 10% of it is in the U.S. Most of it is internationally driven by public policy of other countries. How much can you achieve? My re retort to that question is, how much do you want? Because it's not a matter of technical potential. It's not a matter of our ability to get there. It's, our, it's a matter of our willingness to get there. And again, all the things that I talked about in the last slide is what that's about. So as the steward of the, of the National Investment in Renewable Energy Technology, now for the past 30 years, NREL, we're looking at this thing from the perspective of what, do we, what does it take to get to maximum impact? How can we get to optimum impact? Well, it's really, for us, translated to speed and scale. Speed of technology into the marketplace and the, and the deployment at a scale that's significant and meaningful to make contributions toward energy security, carbon footprint reduction, and, and economic prosperity. So what are the barriers to having that happen? Here we are looking at this thing. I've organized our lab around two things, actually three things. Two, two primary lines of business, renewable fuels, renewable electricity. So the renewable electricity is we need renewables at gigawatt scales. It's about cost, reliability, infrastructure, and dispatchability. I'll say more about that later. Petroleum or uh, displacement is the other big piece. Renewable fuels is about cost, life cycle, sustainability, infrastructure, demand, and utilization. And then the lowest hanging fruit and the piece that's probably least appreciated but the, has the greatest impact is efficiency, end use. And so we try to look at these things as market solutions using technology and innovation, but driving that toward market solutions that are sustainable over the long term. All right. So we have a new president. We have a new administration. I had the opportunity to be with the president on Monday of this week. Um, a very engaging, very, very, uh, uh, I think, committed to the agenda that we've been on literally for 30 years. Now, if you just look at the things that they talked about during the campaign and now that are being implemented, both in stimulus package and in the omnibus bill that we just passed, and in the 2010 budget, which is what we were talking about on Monday, these are the things that have been advertised. I think they're serious about this. First is $150 billion in alternative energy over the next 10 years. That's $15 billion a year. Today's budget, 1.5. All right. So we went from 1.5 to 15 on an annual basis. That's the order of magnitude. That's, that's, that's what we're looking for. That's what we need in terms of investment. Um, again, we've got an economic crisis. It's not, you know, we don't want to minimize that. That's really important. We, in fact, have an opportunity to build on that. Green jobs is kind of what we're about. Um, it doubling renewable energy over the course of the next two years, or next three years, rather. Uh, very doable. Not so simple, but very doable. And I'll talk about that. And then this last part, which is really important, which is you know, we can take all the advantage of what we've invested in the past to get immediate results. But if we're ever going to solve the problem, get to meaningful uh, penetration of clean technologies, we need a, a, a continual investment in innovation. It is about innovation that's going to get us to where we need to be. And so there we are. Here's the president. I was with him when he signed that, that stimulus package a couple of weeks ago in Denver. And, uh, and I think what you're seeing is a lot, a lot of commitment to that. There's now a green team. One of the recommendations we made in the National Science Board is coordinated national strategy. We need a person who coordinates what each of the agencies will do because there's a, there's a contribution from every single agency. And on, and on Monday, I had the opportunity to sit next to Carol Browner. She is committed to the agenda. She's working this thing. John Holdren, good friend of mine from, from Harvard, who's, who's now the science advisor, they will start to put the, put the strategy together around which each of the agencies will participate. Clearly, Department of Energy's got a very, very lead role. But another good friend of mine, uh, Ken Salazar, who used to be the, our senator in, in, in Colorado, now the Secretary of Interior, very focused on renewable energy on federal lands. And the, the subject of my testimony a couple of weeks ago was about how much contribution can you get to the national energy uh, con, uh, uh, electric generation based on putting things on, on federal land. Well, the fact of the matter is, you can get a tremendous amount of, of capability right there 
and we don't have to, it, it, this has a different set of issues, but it's certainly one that's, that's uh, more uh, under our control. All right, let me talk about some of the technologies and some of the things that are going on. Steve Chu, our new Secretary of Energy, likes to say this is the low-hanging fruit. This is the part where we, we get the most bang for the buck. Um, let's see, I've, I've gotten that one out of order. Uh, let, me, let me start here with, with uh, where we are today in first-generation technology, and I'll come back to, to efficiency. Um, so where we are today is this uh, 2008. Uh, we've got you know, a, a serious amount of, 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 uh, of growth in our, in our uh, renewable energy installation. Most of that is this blue bar is wind, is wind technology, again driven by um, the uh, production tax credit that goes along with that. Uh, current clean energy trends are, are, this, are, uh, are given in this slide here. I mentioned that this is a $150, $150 billion business. It is, internationally. This is what you get. It was growing very rapidly until this economic crisis has hit us, and now it's going to slow a bit. That's not that we're, that we're, we're going to backtrack any, but it's going to slow a bit because this is, this is affecting everybody. And, and really, the prices will continue to come down. Um, I, 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 I try to keep abreast of what's going on in the industry, what's, what's happening with, with financial markets. One of the things that's very, very clear to me is that there is a very, very strong effort at reducing prices uh, in, in this particular marketplace. I just got a call from one of the execs at, at BP, um, the British Petroleum. It's got a big solar program, and they're shutting down three plants. You know, the implications are there's going to be loss of jobs and this and that. And uh, my, my uh, question to them was, so what does that mean? What are the implications of that? I mean, is it, you know, how much trouble are we in? Well, the fact of the matter is they're committed to reducing the cost of renewable energy by 25% over the course of the next three years and scaling up to gigawatt capacity. So they're closing down two of their Spanish plants and one of their plants here in the States so that they can retrench and be ready for that marketplace as it goes forward. So what, what you're seeing is an industry shakeout. And that's happening not just with the big companies, but with the small companies. And so th this is not necessarily a bad thing, uh, but it is a dynamic that's in place. And then you need to understand that when you're talking about technology and innovation and what does the marketplace need. It also says that the role of government needs to change. Now, I've been in this business, as I said, for all these years, and our kind of sweet spot was let's be on the innovation side, let's do the research, and let's kind of throw it over the wall and hope something good happens. That's where we've been for 30 years. That's got to change because it is not just about innovation. It is about market restructuring. It's about market behavior, and it's about financial risk. And in order to, in order to I think, bootstrap where I think the, the, the industry momentum had been built over the last couple of years, the role of government needs to change. And that's where national labs, that's where, that's where the stimulus package, that's where the, 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 the partnerships with universities and, um, and states and, and local communities really come into play. All right. So it is about a full spectrum, I would call it top level system holistic view at where we're trying to go. There certainly is the short term stuff, that's what I call accelerated evolutionary technology, and we need to help those industries that are out there trying to scale up and move things into the marketplace. The Europeans are saying they can get to 100%. Um, you know, I, I don't know if you can or not, but I can tell you this, that they're focused on numbers that are much larger than ours. And that's going to take innovation, and that's going to take breakthrough technology. And I am convinced, after having watched the laboratory you know, for all these years, that this is very doable. We, I see more exciting things going on in the laboratory today than I saw 30 years ago when we were first looking at you know, the, the first you know, 5 10% solar cells that are today's market commercial products. OK, so, so Sally mentioned there's a new alliance that runs NREL. It's called the Alliance for Sustainable Energy. Uh, I'm the president of that alliance. I've got all of these people are my bosses. Sally is one of my bosses. Uh, Battelle Memorial Institute, not-for-profit. Midwest Research Institute, another not-for-profit that I work for uh, in, in terms of uh, their you know, business lines. Uh, their 50-50 uh, not-for-profit partnership. And then these universities, the three Colorado Research Inst Institutions, Stanford and MIT. And we thought it was important to have the kind of capabilities that, that these institutions represent as part of helping us set R&D agenda. So this is a unique opportunity both for this institution and for us to partner in ways that we haven't partnered in the past. Our portfolio is not just about supply. That's where we've been noted. It's okay with the wind, the solar folks, and we started off with the Solar Energy Research Institute. Um, it's about renewable supply, of course, but it's also about the end use because you need to look at the problem holistically. It's not let's be wasteful about how we use the technology and just demand more of our supply options. 
No, well, let's do the whole thing holistically. And then the delivery piece is, a bit, is another part, part of it. So we look at the problem holistically. It's about market solutions. It's about reducing risk. All right, so we've had a big effort in these technologies, you know, wind turbines and, and, and biofuels and solar systems. I'm going to go through these in a little bit more detail here in a moment. But there's a whole bunch of new things that are now part of the new approach to putting mac more, more, much more resources, uh, uh, you know, the appropriate amount of resources, in my opinion, on the, on the broad spectrum of technologies that can actually help us get to where we need to be. And as a result, uh, you know, what we've done in the past is ignored a number of different very viable options just because we didn't have the resources to do it. And we wanted to focus on the few things that we'd ac actually do, so we were in what I call scarcity mentality. We would, we would just focus on those very few things, and they'd say, well, what about this, or what about that? And we'd say, yeah, those are great ideas. We don't have enough resources to get there. We now have the opportunity to be much more expansive in our thinking, and that's what you're going to see with all of the new, uh, the new efforts. All right, so first, let's start with now we're efficiency. That, that's where the efficiency breaker slide should have been. All right, so now we're talking efficiencies, buildings. Buildings, in fact, the as-built environment is incredibly inefficient. And it really, it really pains me to see this because I travel all over the world, and almost every country is more efficient than we are. We are incredibly inefficient. And, um, in, and yet, where 40% of the primary energy is, is in our residential and commercial buildings, 71% electricity. That's amazing, absolutely amazing. A lot of that is lighting and plug loads, OK? Um, lots of carbon emissions. All right, we've got, we, we've got um, objectives within the national program that says, let's get to, let's set some goals that are pretty high. Zero energy buildings. People say, well, why can, can you really do that? We're going to demonstrate next year, about this time, I'm moving into a new building, a research support facility, that is going to house 800 people. And in that building, it will generate on an annual basis as much energy as it uses. And it'll be where I live. It'll be where our researchers uh, you know, offer you know, hopefully the best ideas around on, on, on renewable energy. And it'll be a proof, an existence proof, that these things can actually be done. And of course, we're going to be a little forward thinking. Uh, let me give you some of the, some of the statistics that give us some, some, uh, some reason to be, uh, to be aggressive in this area. If you look at the cost, and this is the, 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 the total life cycle cost, including let's assume you had a building and you, and, you, and you purchased it and you got a mortgage for it and you also included the utility bills, and we're using very conservative assumptions on utility bills, and you, and you lump that together in terms of a cost in dollars per year. All right? And then you look at what would the overall energy savings be if I were to put efficiency measures into that home that would save energy and, and, uh, and, and accounting for the cost that's associated with those energy measures. All right? And what we find in almost every kind of building, commercial and residential, is this curve. And this curve essentially is a bunch of data points. It's a, we're running a piece of software here that looks at all of the various variables that are, that are important. And what you see is that for the same life cycle cost, mortgages plus utilities, you can save 65% of the energy that house would use and not spend a single penny more on a life cycle basis. If you wanted to optimize it, you could actually save money and still save 40% of the, of the building energy. All right? Now, what this tells you is that all right, here is a business value proposition that makes sense, and yet in the marketplace, we don't see that happening. Why is that? The why is that part is you got builders that build homes to least cost according to code. You've got tenants who have to pay the uh, energy bills, and they're not connected. You don't have a market signal for the builder, essentially, to put in the efficiency measures. He's not going to get the benefit. That benefit would go to the tenant or the people paying the utilities. So we need to, that's, that's a structural problem. We need to fix that. You can do it a couple ways. One, the easy way is change the building codes. Change the building codes to demand this, all right? As, as simple as that sounds, that's actually the hard way. <laughs> that's, that's almost impossible to do because of overlapping jurisdictions and a variety of other things. But we need to have informed decision makers that understand this and are willing to make the changes. And we can save an incredible amount of energy just based on this alone. And this doesn't take technology. We've got the technology. Technology can improve this, but this is not about technology. If you take that, that particular type of analysis, look at it on a broader scale, what you find, and, and this is a, a study that was done by McKinsey. There's another one. I think the Danish and Vattenfall, or the Swedish and Vattenfall have done the same thing. But you look at what are the costs of, of various actions that you might take on ter in terms of a cost of abatement per ton of CO2 equivalent, all right? And you have all of these things that you can do that essentially are 
cash flow positive, if you will, or business value proposition positive. It doesn't cost you an extra penny, and you can do all of these things and get incredible benefits. That's how we can build a building, 800 people, 200,000 square feet, that can essentially generate as much energy as it saves and not cost us any more. All right? Those are important things to do. There's a lot of other things that you can talk about in terms of carbon cost, but efficiency is your low-hanging fruit. That's really where you ought to go. Let's go to supply for a minute. Wind technology. We've been working on wind technology. I remember back at, in Sandia when I, we started wind technology in the, in the late 70s, you know, the largest blade uh, wingspan was like 1.8 meters. Okay? Now these things are 120 meters across. We're talking huge, huge machines. Um, there's 22,000 megawatts installed in this country, uh, close to 60,000, maybe even more than that worldwide. Um, this is interesting. We're trying to get the cost of six to nine cents a kilowatt hour. That cost in the last 18 months has actually gone up. It's gone up by almost 70 percent. And the reason is commodity prices went up. Now, due to the financial meltdown, those costs will come back down. It's not so much that, we, that we're targeting a specific set of costs. We need to get to grid parity. That's really what we're about. It's the relative cost. Um, lots of things that are going on here. It's very exciting. Um, last year, uh, we were part of a study that said, what is the potential for renewable, uh, for, for wind technology to satisfy the, the uh, electricity generation of the country? And uh, with some very modest assumptions, our conclusion was that you can get 20% of our electricity generating, generated by wind by the year 2030 in this country, based on the assumptions that we made, and, and in fact, uh, it's, it's, it's a significant amount of energy. It's 300 gigawatts. 50 gigawatts about, of that, by the way, is offshore of the U.S., but uh, offshore of the, of the in, in, in water, and offshore uh, wind generation. Um, but, it's, but it's doable. The point is that it's doable. And this, and this has a lot, we've made a lot of assumptions about, about supply and, 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 uh, and ways in which the, the, uh, the uh, uh, wind generators connect into the grid. And so we're not building a whole bunch of new grid structures, but in fact, you can get there. Uh, what we need to do is, is actually continue to look at what are, what's the performance and reliability of wind generators. Um, one of the things I can tell you when I, when, I, when I talked about that report, I mentioned at the time uh, to the public media that uh, something like two-thirds of the wind generation of this country had been in service for less than three years. And what we really don't know is about reliability. We're, we're seeing some, some um, gearbo uh, gearbox um, failures that scare me. Um, we need to have a very robust program. This is why the financial community is, is a bit skittish about, so I'm going to make, take these big bets, I'm going, to take, I'm going to take on this risk, and then what happens later? All right? You need a national program for the purpose of making sure that we have integrity in, in, the, in the performance of the, of the technology that's going out. That's part of what we do at our laboratory and part of why research is necessary to understand wind flow patterns and, and, uh, and the way uh, in which you predict wind and those kinds of things. When you look at wind integration into the marketplace, you're really talking about the technology itself. You're talking about siting and licensing and the EIAs and all the environmental stuff that goes with that. And you're talking about how does it integrate into a grid. One of the difficulties, and I'll get to this in a minute, is this grid. This grid is not very smart. It's not very, it wasn't designed for variable resources. It was designed for big power plants, big wires, in a, you know, last century stuff. And uh, that's where we are. We need a lot more to do on that. I'll talk about that in a minute. Let's talk about solar. Um, PV is kind of the glamour child of the, of, of the technology. You hear a lot about PV. Uh, I, I don't have anything on this slide uh, about solar hot water heating. But that really is the low-hanging fruit in solar. It's amazing to me that we don't use solar as a, as a, a tool for, for, for heating, because obviously that's the, the, uh, the, the, the most cost-effective approach that we can take. Most other countries do a lot more on that than we do. They do more in China. They do more in Europe than we do on that. We should do a lot more. But our national program is focused on electricity, and this is what we've been about. We've been about both concentrating uh, solar power, which is solar thermal, so to speak, and, and then and then uh, photovoltaics, which is, again, very elegant technology and, uh, and, some, and some great opportunities. I show this slide because I was in Denmark last week, as I mentioned. And, um, you know, they were, they were trying to debate whether or not they're going to get in the solar business. You know, Germany is in the solar business. Germany's been in the solar business now for some time with very aggressive public policies. And I always joke, Germany has the, the, the solar resource of Anchorage, Alaska. And they are the world's biggest market in photovoltaics. And you say, well, kind of, what, what's, what's, what doesn't compute here? 
Actually, they have a very good reason to be in solar. And this, and this chart tends to do that. This is a McKinsey study. What this is is dollars per kilowatt hour. This is the price of energy that you pay in these various regions of the world. This axis is the amount of solar resource that you have. And, and it's based on the amount of kilowatt hours that you can, that you can generate per kilowatt of installed capacity of a, of a system. All right? So big numbers here means you can get a lot, you got a lot more solar, a lot less solar. All right, what's interesting, Denmark is up here, doesn't have much solar, but they've got a really high cost of energy. And so as a result, these are, the, these are grid parity lines up here. So if you, you know, and I'll find California. Here's California. Okay, so California is actually pretty good on, in terms of its, it, you know, you want to be up this line here to make, to make solar actually make me more, more sense to you. But see, Denmark is actually probably in, this, in, this, uh, in the California cost effectiveness range. I mean, it does make sense for them. Even though they don't have much solar, in terms of what they get back for it, in terms of benefit, it's, it's, it's important to do that. And, and uh, you know, you ask, uh, so China and some of the other countries that have lots of solar, they also have very low energy costs. And so you, you, you wonder about that, what does it take to promote these technologies in these marketplace? It's about the market price. What's the market price? How does it compare to what other options you have? So uh, I, I show that only because uh, I believe solar will be one of the most important renewable energy resources going forward. I've, I've frequently said that I think mid-century solar will, there'll be, there'll be more solar energy generation than all the other renewables energy combined. Today, it's behind. It's behind because we don't have the technology. But eventually, it'll be the big, the big, uh, the big flyer. This is one of the largest PV systems in the country. It's 8.5 megawatts. We have it in Colorado. Um, and that's what a photovoltaic 8.5 megawatt system looks like. That's a big thing. You, know? you probably want to go to concentrating solar power if you're going to do hundreds of megawatts kind of things. We've been about research. This is a kind of a, I call it kind of a technology progress slide. It's not important to look at the details, other than they're all kind of pointed in this direction. Uh, which means that you know we're seeing you know when I started in the business we were back here you know it was it was a pretty rare thing to see a 10% solar cell today we're at 40 plus and I think what you'll find these technologies now are 20% in the marketplace and these technologies ultimately will be uh, in the marketplace as well and I think uh, it's it's really important um, there is a whole potpourri of technology opportunities we're not in the business of picking winners and losers as I like to say but we are in the business of pulling together a portfolio of technology opportunities that the market's going to choose from. So we've, we're, we're pushing the technology frontiers in a lot of different areas. Some of these are going to make it big. Some of them are not going to be so big. But the important thing is they all have got to come down to these costs. And so cost targets are, you know, we're, we're kind of in this area right now. So, you know, we're in the 30, 30 cents kilowatt hour for some of the residential things. And, uh, and less than that, maybe 20%, 20 cents kilowatt hour for, for some of the utility uh, scale things. Uh, we're within striking distance of some very, very important things, and this is average cost. You've got to recognize that in the sunny southwest, you can actually, I think I've got a, a, a thing on that. Um, in the sunny southwest, you've got uh, an opportunity to have a value of your, of your energy that's much, much higher than these average costs. I'll mention that here in a second. Uh, so module costs are coming down. This is what we're, our research programs are about. We expect lots of progress in these areas. It doesn't say, let's wait until we get here before we can start to implement in the marketplace. You need to start putting things in the marketplace. This is going to be done not so much by the government programs, but by the private sector. This is where innovation occurs and happens very aggressively. Uh, this little pitch, a little, a little um, uh, promotional for, for our laboratory. Uh, the, the, when I said the role of government needs to change, we need to be in the marketplace helping the, the, the private sector move more quickly. What I've told you know, the former president and now this president is we need to shorten the time that it takes to get technology into the marketplace. How do you do that? Well, part of it is technology normally progr progresses slowly because you have to convince a bunch of finance people that you're, you're not a high risk and that they're going to get a return on their investment. How do you do that? You do that by reducing the technical uncertainty and reducing the regulatory uncertainty. And that's what we're about. This is really about helping. These are called cluster tools, and we're trying to help the industry as they develop their product to move more quickly in the marketplace and, and convince their financiers that, uh, that they're not that high risk. This is concentrating solar power. Um, lots of activity on, on, on this part, primarily because we can begin to have storage. As photovoltaics, as you know, is very difficult to, to, to store the, 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 uh, the energy. In solar thermal, you can actually put you know, working fluids in, you know, create a, a, thermal, a thermal gradient that you can exp exp uh, exploit, and ultimately lengthen the time that the power plant generates 
And, and this is being done. In fact, I'm headed to Spain this, this weekend, and, uh, and they're doing it in Spain with government subsidies that's really going to lay out, I think, some, some, some really important existence proofs. If you just look at the, at the Western U.S., and we've done this for the Western governors, and I also did this for the Department of, of Interior, and, and say, you know, if you just use the best sites only, excluded all the other stuff that, that you really can't build on or somehow, you know, it's too difficult to build on, and look at only the things that are close to transmission lines, Concentrating solar power by itself has six times the U.S. generation capacity of, uh, of, of what we use in electricity. I mean, there's just a tremendous amount of resource. It is not a matter of how much resource is there. It's a matter of how, how do we capture it, how do we exploit it. Let me say a word about geothermal. I'll come back to it later. Geothermal is, is, is a technology that's been around for literally, you know, 40 years, and uh, we haven't made much progress. We've got some new stuff that's kind of beginning to get under development. But it's, it's waned, and again, it falls into that category that I talked about earlier, scarcity mentality. Haven't been focused on it. Hasn't been worth the, worth the effort. Money has been chasing other, other opportunities. We, we were told two years ago to shut down our geothermal program. Uh, the new administration in the stimulus bill put $400 million in geothermal this year. Amazing. Uh, it's, it's, uh, you know, there's like from here to there. So I'm not sure that we can ramp up from zero to $400 million in one year, but um, we're going we're gonna to try to do that. Biofuels. Let me talk about biofuels. Um, biofuels is important. Um, you know, quite frankly, I'll, 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 be, I'll be candid with all of you. I, I think it's, uh, I don't, I'm not as vulnerable today as I was a couple years ago. Uh, one thing I'll say about this is we got, you know, we got all excited about uh, ethanol, corn ethanol, and that was uh, the country got kind of agricultural policy mixed up with energy policy. Okay? We kind of get that. We understand that. Uh, really what this is about is... Um, it's not about corn ethanol. We know that. It's about cellulosic ethanol as a first of a kind, first generation, a new thing. You know, Brazil's been doing this forever. We've got a great relationship with our colleagues down there at Petrobras. And I, I think one of the things that we're recognizing is that this is very doable, and we can get there fairly quickly. And, the, and kind of the low-hanging fruit, let's go get something quickly, is corn stove or, or agricultural res, residuals that you can convert to uh, ethanol. Um, we, we started down this path. We, we had some partners, DuPont, Genencor, Novozymes, that found out some, that found that we, you know, it's kind of the magic formula for, for breaking down cellulosic uh, structures through a biochemical uh, transport and then moving that through, uh, through a fermentation process to get to ethanol. It was, it was, I mean, it's kind of, you know, the, 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 the Brazilians just ferment sugarcane. I mean, that's simple. That's easy. They got lots of water. They got lots of sugarcane, high, high sugar content. We were trying to do something much, much harder than that, and now that's why they're partnering with us because we can improve their processes. Um, what we found was that there are these, there are these uh, long polymer chains of, 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 uh, of these uh, hydrocarbons, or, or carbohydrates rather, and you can break those apart with, with certain kinds of enzymes, and they allow, allows us to get in there and then operate on those in, an, in a very, very unique way and turning them into six, uh, C5 and C6 sugars. And once we got to the C5, C6 sugars, we could then ferment those and create ethanol. And what that allowed us to do is to reduce the cost, and this is, this is the conversion cost, uh, primarily enzymes of ethanol from that type of a number, from $6 a gallon, down to this kind of a number, which is like $2.50 a gallon. And this is back when gasoline was like $4 a gallon. Okay? Well, this got, this got the government pretty excited. They said, whoa, you mean you can do this? And we said, sure, and if you like that, we can do this. All right? So that's how the program got started. That's what we've been about, and that's a good thing because I think it's focused the country's attention on, oh, so biofuels actually could make a difference. And the short answer is, uh, yeah. And then uh, it's really more about what's beyond that. Okay? And our new Secretary of Energy, very, very bullish on biofuels. We put literally $400 million in biosciences. All right? But it's about third generation and fourth generation. Everything from a bunch of different types of products to you know, things that are kind of what I would call kind of game changers like algae. All right, which is, which is, these are phenomenal technologies. If you just look at the, at the pathways that you might want to uh, consider, feedstocks without in, uh, in any way affecting food products, okay, feedstocks of all kinds, all right, and look at the end transportation fuels, all right, there is a multitude of pathways that we can go to. Now, we've been focused on these. Okay? So we've been focused on, uh, actually, we've been focused on lignocellulosic, down here to fermentation, and over to ethanol. I mean, that's what we've been focused on. That's kind of what we have. It's a good thing. We're, we're making progress. You know, we, the corn farmers are happy. But that's really not what this is about. What this is about is taking what I call carbohydrate molecules and turning them into 
hydrocarbon molecules that can be effectively put in our infrastructure without changing the infrastructure entirely. This makes sense. This can be done. It is not a matter, again, of technical potential or whatever. It's a matter of will. We can get there. All right, I'll talk about, about hydrogen. Hydrogen is important. I mean, it's the, it's the ultimate fuel because it's got uh, all the attendant benefits. I, I don't need to remind you of those. But uh, hydrogen you know, was kind of the administration's big push uh, in the last uh, four years, last eight years. Um, I still think that hydrogen is a player in the mix. It may not be the near-term player, but it's a player in the mix worthy of our, of our continued support. We've made some good progress. We're coming down. Fuel cells now need to be about $30 a kilowatt. They are about $100 a kilowatt, about three, a factor of three away. And we need to make conversion of, of, of hydrogen production. Hydrogen production from anything but renewable energy doesn't make sense. All right? And we, and we, we abandon our renewable energy hydrogen production. Again, I'm on my soapbox because I testified in front of Congress on this one a couple weeks ago as well. And is, is uh, you know, we, we've been able to reform uh, you know, natural gas. Well, that's great. We've got, a, we've got a way to do it. But you really need to get hydrogen production from renewable energy uh, at some point in the future if, if, if nuclear technology were, in fact, to, to be viable uh, long term and, and, and solve all of its issues, it could also be produced from, 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 uh, from nuclear. But there's a whole uh, uh, thing. This is not an easy thing to do, but it is something that we need to pursue. Other pathways, more fundamental stuff, stuff that's going on here at Stanford that, I'm, that I was very impressed by uh, in, in a number, number of different ways is, you know, I mean, ultimately everything starts with solar energy, uh, even though we're, you know, it converts to wind and we go through electrolysis and we, and we split water to get hydrogen. There are some other pathways, photobiological, photobiochemical, that are very exciting, and it's really fundamental stuff. And you can do it on the nanoscale, and you can do a variety of, of different things that go along with that. Advanced vehicles, I'd be remiss if I didn't say something about advanced vehicles. Um, you know, ultimately, we need to change our transportation uh, paradigm. Uh, it really is something that, that's, that's, that's mind-boggling uh, uh, mind, uh, to me in terms of how much we have to do in transportation. Again, I was in Denmark last week. They pay $8 a gallon of gasoline equivalent for their petrol. I thought that was bad enough. But the other thing that they do that is not so well known is that if you buy an automobile in Denmark, you pay 250% tax. You buy a $40,000 vehicle, it costs you $140,000. All right? That'll change your behavior. Okay? <laughs> so as a result, it's raining, it's snowing outside. I see people in business suits like me on a bicycle, you know, he headed to work. You know, that's just the way you do it in Denmark. All right? Now, I'm not suggesting we all ride bicycles, although I know <laughs> Bob Moppet's been riding bicycles for a long time. Um, and, and the th thing is, we've got to change our paradigm on transportation. That's the point. The point is, okay, so let's make our cars more efficient. I think that's important. Let's also make our transportation systems more environmentally friendly. Let's think about transport in a different way than we've thought about it before. All right, so there's all kinds of stuff that's going on. You know, I hope Detroit gets it together. I don't know that they will, but I hope they get it together. They've really not been focused on the things that are important. Uh, I don't know if it's, if it's too late to save them, but whatever. We've got, we got a lot of things to do in the, in the vehicle area. We at NREL have been looking at this. Transportation is important primarily because we were looking at it from the perspective of displacement of foreign oil. All right? Well, that's important, too. That's a national security issue. All right? But it's really not just about national security. It's about a whole bunch of other things that relate to a green energy economy, transforming our energy economy. Uh, fuels performance, lots of things that go with that. I'm not going to belabor any of this stuff. These are things that we do at NREL, testing and analysis and things that go with that. New emerging uh, areas. Okay, so I mentioned geothermal a while ago. There's an MIT study that came out that said enhanced geothermal study, opportunity for base load, you know, it's got really, really great potential. And I agree with that. Uh, it is still, I'll say a word about that in a minute. Ocean tidal is another big thing that started. And smart grid. You're hearing a lot about smart grid. $4.5 billion in the stimulus package on smart grid. And, and then a whole bunch of other stuff. I talked about these. Ironically, we're doing more and more partnerships with more and more countries. And there is more, there is more work with the, with the Middle East today than ever before. I think you know that. You've got a relationship with Saudi Arabia. But UAE, this is the infrastructure minister of Iraq. Um, surprising. I mean, he was just adamant we were going to sign an MOU. So here we are. We're signing an MOU. Got a relationship with the with uh, energy, renewable energy in Iraq. I thought that was great. Um, enhanced geothermal systems. If you do a mapping of potential, it's huge. Uh, ocean kinetics, same sort of thing. Both of these are embryonic technologies. Let's just call it what it is. We don't really know what we can get and how much we can get there. Uh, there's a lot of uncertainty in what we do to ex do to uh, to extract 
you know, geothermal. This is what the $400 million in the stimulus package is about. Go find out more about enhanced geothermal and drill how, far, how, how uh, deep you have to drill, what kind of reservoirs you have to, you have to do. Same thing with, with water programs. Smart grid. Um, you know, again, I mentioned the grid of last century was big wires, big power plants connecting those. Not very smart. This is what we need is, is a distributed supply options, distributed load, load demand side as well. But even more importantly than that, it's this broader holistic look at, at, look at what is it that we really want in terms of services from our energy system. Uh, two things about, about smart grid, and they're right here. Lack of load control, energy storage requirements, uh, lack thereof. You change these, and you really change everything. All right, so, so there is some things that we can do, that's new, and it's more than just smart meters. Okay? Smart grid is not just smart meters. People talk about that in many different ways. There's certainly a component of that, but there's a lot more that needs to be done here. This problem needs to be studied. It needs to be studied on, on a very um, a rigorous uh, perspective, and then there needs to be an implementation strategy that's top down. I don't think this is going to happen bottoms up. This is one of those areas where we need some government intervention. Breakthrough translational science. So this is something, again, opportunity for us to work more closely with universities. If we're going to build the knowledge workers of the future, if we're going to build an economy based on, on, on instead of the cheapest, the cheapest technology econ uh, commodity markets that there are, but in fact a high-tech, more sophisticated energy economy that relates to essentially services and, 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 uh, and, and technology capabilities, we need knowledge workers. And, and this is an opportunity to begin building relationships and consortia on a national level to build the next generation knowledge worker. Uh, Multi-institute uh, collaboration, a variety of different things. <clears throat> this, is, this is a campaign that needs to last for years. When we talk about improving the, the, the investment in, 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 in science, this is what it's about, and it really bridging that basic to applied. So at our laboratory, we're about the marketplace, and we're trying to understand the marketplace. My mission is accomplished when, when the marketplace adopts technology. It's great to do the, the, the basic stuff and the, and, and the ideas to bubble up, but somehow we've got to get them into the marketplace. So that's why the partnership with institutions that have strong research capabilities, basic research capabilities, like you have at Slack, like you have here in, in some of the things that are going on in, in GSAP, uh, I think are really, really important. We have new facilities that we're building. Uh, I'm really jazzed about this because with it, our little lab, you know, sleepy little lab, has been neglected literally for 30 years. And uh, we had our 30-year anniversary a couple years ago, and I, and I announced to the staff, uh, which at that time was you know, 900 strong, uh, I said, you know, it took us 30 years to become an overnight success. And, and that's really where we've been, and that's where we are today. Uh, we've gotten more infrastructure um, investment in the last two years than we did in the previous 30. That's over $200 million. The next two years, I've already acquired an additional $200 million. I've got half a billion dollars worth of, worth of construction going on in our laboratory right now. Almost looks like your quad, the new quad that you have over here. It's uh, almost, almost that impressive. So good stuff that's going on. Oh, one of the new facilities is an important one. It's, it's, it's a laboratory that's focused on energy systems integration. So how do you take the interoperability of all these various, both demand side and supply side technologies, and integrate those onto the grid so that we can begin to make that grid transformation? The utilities aren't going to do this until they have the existence proof and they have a place to go that they can see this stuff in, in operation you know, so that they can have a little bit of certainty that it's not going to wreck the bottom line for them. So that's what they're working on. I think it's important. I'll, I'll end up with, with, with the idea that this is not a, only a domestic problem. This is an international problem. The U.S. can do everything we did that we're, we're talking about here and then some, meet all our targets, you know, 80% reduction of carbon by, by 2050, like the president wants to do, and not make a dent in climate change if India and China aren't on board. It's absolutely essential that we get relationships engaged with, 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 uh, with other uh, countries who are of like mind and those who need to be of like mind. And again, you know, my, my good friend uh, Vinod Khosla likes to say, we will not have um, uh, success until we get technologies to the Chindia price. Now, the Chindia price is the price that's competitive in China and India. Okay? Absolutely true. And what we need to do is start putting the things in place that allow us to start moving down that efficiency curve and cost curve to get us to the Chenia Prize as soon as possible. We need to share our technologies. as well. I'll tell Secretary Clinton when I get a chance to talk to her. We need to share these technologies with other nations. This is in our national interest. This is not a matter of, you know, let's protect ourselves against trade, this and that. This is in our national interest. We should do this collaboratively. So as a result, uh, now I haven't been to all these places, but I've been to a number of them. 
And we, what we're doing is, in fact, connecting with research institutions wherever they exist and connecting in bilateral institutions at the, at the Chinese Academy and, and, the, and, the British, and, the, and the Indian Petroleum Companies, Brazilian Petroleum Countries, and, and all the places that really where I, I think there is an opportunity to, to, uh, to have uh, an impact. And I can tell you this without reservation, is that every country that I visit are anxious for the U.S. to lead. They are anxious for us to lead. It's, it's, uh, and it's, it's a message that I preach over and over. So last point, it's about mobilizing capital. The government really isn't going to do this. It's going to be done by the private sector. It's about technology and innovation, certainly. But it's also about markets, market restructuring, policies that enable us to get to where we need to be. And I think ultimately, we've got a really, really good chance at success. Even in these difficult times, I think it's important that you recognize that there's real good opportunity out there. Thank you. Thank for you. Thank you for your email. I read your. I read your stuff. <laughs> um, let, let me, and I'll give you some more uh, direct feedback on, on that uh, when we get a chance to talk privately. Um, a couple things. First of all, uh, our role as 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 a national laboratory is to make sure that we get as as much uh, rigor and fidelity around the science and the analysis and the capabilities where we can offer honest, objective opinions. Okay. And so our role really is about assessing what policy options might be and offering some level of opinion of what, if you turn this knob, what outcome do you get? And do that in a transparent sort of way so that policymakers and financiers and developers can look at what are the assumptions. If I change the assumption, what does that, what does that do to the outcome? All right. So I need that tool set. It's complicated. Lots of things that go along, it, along with that. Ultimately, there's a bunch of judgments about you know, what's more important, this or that. And so without, you know, in fact, when I had this, I had a fairly, a fairly lengthy conversation with President Bush when he came out to our laboratory, and I talked about feed-in tariffs. I talked about the experience in Germany. I talked about the experience in Japan, all of which say there are some subsidy or government intervention mechanisms that have huge effects in the marketplace. And um, Germany was driven by job creation during the, during the unification of the old and the new. Uh, Japan driven by a whole different set of drivers. You know, my, my challenge to Bush was, uh, so what's our policy? You know, you know I, we're happy to analyze something for you. You know, you know give me something to analyze. I'll look at it. Uh, I think now we've got a number of things. I think the new administration is actually trying to be very thoughtful. Um, uh, we have analyzed several bills, the Bingaman bill, the Markey bill, and a number of others in terms of RPSs. As a, as a, as a personal matter, not speaking for the lab, but as a personal matter, I think uh, the will in Congress is not ready for cap and trade. They're not really ready for anything really aggressive on RPSs. Uh, but I think we need something symbolic. We need, we need, to, get, we need to change the game. You were talking at lunch today that, uh, in fact, with, with, with President Hennessy earlier, uh, the captains of industry, both in the oil companies and in utilities, are all recognizing we're going to have public policy in this area. We're going to put a price on carbon. Okay? And the question is, how do we do that? And feed-in tariff, obviously, is one of those. The country is coming from way back, okay? So we've got a long ways to go to get mentally prepared for what that means. And right now, uh, I don't think we're prepared. And as a result, you, you're going to have a lot, of, a lot of back and forth. I think you need something symbolic to say we're on this track, we're not going back. And even though it's modest, we need to do that, and then more will follow later. In terms of the analysis, you know, we could agree with you until, the, you know, until we're all kind of in, in, in great harmony. But um, as a practical matter, it's a, it's a political thing. And, and, the, and the politics of it are is that we're going to have to take fairly small steps to get everybody moving in the same direction. Once we start moving and the market starts responding, I think you'll see major changes. It's, it's, it is, it is that, it's that uh, fear that doing something so dramatically different is, gonna, is going to change the game so radically that we won't be able to accommodate. It'll unintended consequences. So we need to be deliberate about those first baby steps, but then recognize that, okay, so now we're on a different track, folks. We're not playing 
basketball, we're playing rugby or whatever, <laughs> whatever it is. Uh, and, but the rules of the game need to change. We don't even, we're not even playing the same game right now. And I think a lot needs to be done there. So we'll talk more about the specific of that policy, but I think it's more of the bigger issue. Back there. Um, so you, you hear a lot about that te the technology is there, it needs to be implemented on a seminar scale. And you hear, but you always hear that Congress is not ready. There's no political will. So what is it going to take to get the political will to start the spark that drives everything else? Great question, and uh, one we've been struggling with for a long time. Uh, my, my perspective is the reason we've got any national public policy is because we have local public policy. This is all happening at the state level. This is happening grassroots. You know, it was really interesting. I hosted the president of Sweden, and, and uh, he went, you know, he visited Bush, and he visited Arnold Schwarzenegger, and then he visited me. I thought, wow, that's great company. Um, but his, his, when he went back to his country, what he told the Europeans was, you know, you're, you think nothing's happening in the U.S.? Actually, a lot's happening in the U.S. More is happening in the U.S. than you Europeans really understand or, you know, appreciate. And, and quite frankly, we're doing more in some respects than they are. Okay, now, they, they, different mindset, different things going on. But it's grassroots. Things are happening at the grassroots level. And I've made this pitch a number of times to various governors and states, and, they, and I say, look, you need, you need, if, if, you can, if you can marshal the notion that local economic development is, is, is um, promoted and encouraged by a focus on green technology, then it'll take off by itself. And you need essentially three things. You need, you need a business community that's receptive to do it. You need resources of some sort, you know, whether they be natural or, or otherwise financial. And you need knowledge workers. You need, a, you need essentially a university or some you know, type, of, type of technology driving force in the community. When you have those three ingredients, things happen. And so we're seeing that happen, and I think you know, the feds kind of get shamed into, into doing public policy because they see the states are out in front of them. And uh, that makes fed stuff harder. But I, I think we're starting to, get a, we're starting to close that gap. And, and, and more and more, again, there's, I, I think uh, uh, part of it has to do with the fact that there just isn't, that there hasn't been uh, some major mechanism that can only happen at the federal level. At the federal level, you need to do two things. One is you need to put a price on carbon that's, that's uniformly recognized. And the second is you've got to deal with the transmission and distribution. Both of those things are absolutely essential before we can make major progress. That can be driven by the, by the bottoms up stuff. So it's not a simple thing, and you know, I can go into much more detail about that, but in the interest of time, I won't. Uh, but there are some mechanisms that we can use that kind of fool the system, if you will. Because it's really not so simple as to say, let's everybody jump on the bandwagon and let's pull in that direction. It doesn't happen that way. And, and it's, not so much a bi it's not so much a partisan issue as it is a regional issue. There are regions of the country who feel very disadvantaged by any kind of talk and promotion of carbon-free technology. And it's because they stand to lose something. And it's that balance that's really difficult. Let's see a question on the left side. I have two questions. Um, the first question I want to comment on the uh, impact on the uh, financial crisis and uh, also the government policy on the renewable energy. As far as I know, um, most of the project uh, up to 80% have been halted due to the economic crisis. And there was a lot of uh, government policy trying to support the situation and for the new president, the, for the uh, commercial recovery and uh, the investment factor, the investment 60 billion for this. I'm not sure how much, uh, to what extent this will help this situation to report to me. And the sixth question is um, about the product needs. Uh, from one slide, you showed that the generating capacity dominated by the wind. I'm not sure why you have to use, uh, choose wind because uh, the, uh, the wind has much higher marginal cost compared to the hydropower and the, the dark field. So I'm not sure if it comes on the strategic initiative behind this. Thank you. Okay, so, so the first question had to do with stimulus spending and, and how much can that really help and is it, yeah, to what extent. Um, look, I, I, I applaud the notion that the, the, the administration is, is wanting to, to move their agenda uh, in, a, in a constructive way, the green agenda on the, on, the, on the idea of we need stimulus spending and we'll spend it on something that's productive and, 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 and constructive. Um, I think that can help. I, I'm really nervous about how much money is being spent in what short period of time because I don't think it'll have the same value or effect that it could have if you spend it over a longer period of time. 
But given the economic realities of where we are, you know, I, I'm not going to second guess that other than to say it's not sufficient. You can do that, and if you don't do the balance, if you don't invest in the innovation, if you don't do the policy measures to help change the marketplace conditions, you really will not, not have captured the benefit that we're after. So there's, there's two pieces of that, and, and we don't know about the first one until we do the second one. So that's kind of the answer to the first one. Regarding wind, the reason, the reason you, you, that, you, that you're seeing so much wind in the U.S., and it's kind of the same all over the world, is that it is the, it is the technology that is the lowest cost technology today of all the renewables. So, well, it, not, not compared to, well, so large hydropower I don't include in these analyses. So large hydropower is pretty much tapped out. There's not much more uh, large hydropower, and most of that large hydropower, if you were to do it, has huge environmental impacts. You've got to really consider all those things. There's run a river hydropower. That's a smaller fraction. But, uh, but hydropower is obviously a very, very good thing, and it's especially in tandem with the other technologies. But the non-hydro technologies are one of ones that we're focused on, and wind is the one that's the least cost today. I think it's the bridge technology. Or, or, you know, we can do a lot with wind, and then we'll do more with the others later, I think is the, is the, is the answer. So we'll take uh, one last question. What would you say to Stanford graduate students that are really taking advantage of all the interdisciplinary opportunities in both policy and science in terms of how they can best you know, really make an impact and implementation after they graduate and go out into the U.S. workforce? Well, uh, thanks, thanks for the question, because I, I think so much of... <laughs> Oh, I see. I, <laughs> thanks, Jeff. Thanks for translating that for me. I got it. <laughs> uh, all right. So, so here, here's 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 what my 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 counsel. First, first of all, um, we we at, at at our laboratory are very much about trying to trying to you know uh, help educate the public and and in fact the next generation knowledge workers about what it's going to take to get to a, a transformed new energy economy, what I call the sustainable energy economy. Um, it is, it is, it's not a trivial thing. It's, it's, it's going to take you know, multidisciplinary education. It's going to take a, 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 um, a connection of understanding of how innovation and technology fit into business value propositions and a market condition. Uh, it takes an awareness of the general population that carbon, re carbon footprint reduction and displacement of liquid transportation fuels that we import from the Middle East or wherever else uh, are things that are not in our, our best national interest, that in fact we need to change that paradigm. Um, you know, we, we need time to move the technology into grid parity competitiveness. And, and so this, is, this has got to be a national effort like health care is for us baby boomers who are all getting old and now uh, want the government and others to, to make sure that we've got all the things in place that are going to take care of us. Um, it, it, is, it is the biggest challenge, I think, of, the, of, this, of this century uh, to, 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 because energy is tied up with so many other things. So in terms of education, I think it's getting, getting this holistic understanding and certainly I think we've got, we, we don't have a, a science literate general population and that's a problem because you can't talk to them about risk. I mean, the, 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 the science education of the, of the general population used to be eighth grade. It's not even eighth grade anymore. It's like sixth grade, right? Uh, that's a problem because you, you need to have a much more sophisticated consumer. And so, so much of what we do is to try to educate not only people who are in the field doing the R&D, but people who are out doing real estate, people who are out building, you know, the new Walmart stores, uh, you know, or, or, you know, big box type stuff. And, understand, and people that are designing the next transportation system or community planning or, or next public official, there is something that every one of those stakeholders needs to be doing differently tomorrow than they're doing today. And I think so much of what I, oh, I'm encouraged by is kind of the next generation, you know, your generation, kind of gets this. It's not a hard sell for you. <laughs> it's a hard sell for folks my age. And, and unfortunately, uh, I don't think that, that's going to change very quickly. But... You know, the, the, the whole notion of the principles that, in, that are engaged with recycling and, and cleaning up your mess and being responsible and all those kinds of things, which you're kind of supposed to learn in, in elementary school, uh, you know, those, those basic principles, I think, need to be reexamined and reinforced going forward. So, you know, part, part of what I would say to the, to the next generation is um, this is a problem that we only recently have started to come to grips with, but it's a problem that you've got to live with.
For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.